Welcome to Loud Poets. Please clap your hands, stamp your feet, and make some noise for your host and compare, Kevin McLean. Hello, 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 and welcome to Loud Poets! Oh yeah, that is what I need on a Friday evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming along to Loud Poets, the central heat slam round I was drinking backstage. <laughs> Fucked it. <laughs> this is the central heat. This is the sla- our last regional heat in our Loud Poets Slam series. We are very, very excited to have. That's why if, if you come to our shows normally here and are confused as to why I've assembled a small poetry army on the stage, that is why. This is a, a bit of a different evening for us. My name is Kevin McLean. I will be your host for this evening. Give me a little cheer if you have been to Loud Poets before. <laughs> the Poets. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Give me a little cheer if this is your first ever Loud Poets. How was that the same people? Are you guys, are this like your first outing? You are just excited to be in the wild. That's wonderful. Okay, hey, okay we'll, we'll, go, we'll go for a different one. Give me a little cheer if you have been to a slam before. Ah, see, now we're chopping it down. Uh, give me a little cheer if you have never been to a slam. You guys are just, that is too much excitement. Uh, no, well, that's, that's good for the, the ones of you who have never been to a slam and for the ones who just like fucking whooping. Uh, I will run over what is going on for you. Uh, there, there must be one person here who did not know we were doing a slam and is so confused at what's happening. Uh, yes, uh, normally we have a, a showcase when we are here, uh, but all, all year long, if you've been coming along to Loud Poets, you will have heard me, heard me talking about these slams that we're doing. And we have been all over the country. We have been, <laughs> as I try and remember where we've been, we have been to Inverness, Dundee, Dumfries, Inverclyde, Aberdeen, and now right here in Edinburgh doing a series of these slams. Uh, big shout out and thank you to Creative Scotland who paid for all that. Whoop. <laughs> This is a Creative Scotland funded season. We are so, so, so exceptionally thankful uh, to have the support of Creative Scotland. Uh, And all those slams that are happening, we have regional partners for all of them that it has been an absolute pleasure to work with. Uh, And what's happening is we get a winner and runner up from all of those slams and they all come together to take uh, take part in our Grand Slam final, which will... (laughs) Woo indeed. I forgot I'm dealing with the most panto audience ever. I should have played that casual and built up, but you peaked early. Uh, it's going to be part of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> None of you are allowed in. Uh, <laughs> book Festival's got standards, baby! Uh, no, we're very, very excited to be partnering with the Book Fest. Uh, we, we did some work with them last year on a spoken word showcase. We will be back this year with the Grand Slam final. It's very, very cool to see them embracing spoken word. It has been wonderful working with them. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because there's some of them here. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's been lovely. And the winner of that Grand Slam final will win £3,000. Yeah, if you know anything about poetry or money, that's a fucking lot. Uh, we are very, very excited. Uh, it's it's amazing how much easier it's been to get slammers to sign up to your slam when you have a three grand cash prize for them. Weird that. Uh, but the three grand isn't the real prize. No, 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 no. The real prize, what everyone is really competing for, is the Loud Poet Slam Championship belt. <laughs> the respect it deserves. I'm so, the one most annoying thing about this is I organized this, so we'll never win that. <laughs> Desperately sad. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, I take it home with me. We sleep together every night, it's lovely. In a very a- asexual, platonic kind of way. Next to each other. Uh, no one's gonna hold the belt up at the end of this now. <laughs> So how do we decide who wins three grand? How do we decide who gets the coveted Loud Poets Slam Championship belt? Well, we do slams. We judge poetry, which is a ridiculous thing to attempt to do. Uh, 
but we've been giving it a good go because Creative Scotland gave us the money. So, <laughs> must make do. Uh, no, uh, the way it works is we have three beautiful judges. We have 12 wonderful slammers. They all perform poems. The judges give scores. By the end of the night, there will be one victorious poet uh, and one runner-up. And they will join the cohort of poets at the Bookfest final. Uh, so our wonderful judges this evening, can we give, make some noise for Mary McCall? <laughs> Mary is, as well as being just a wonderful poet and a lovely person, is a former Loud Poets Slam champion. Absolutely. Uh, I, I don't remember what year, because it was in amidst all the chaos that has become 2021. All I need to say is 2020-21, and you get why I don't remember the year. Uh, it was in the vague time. Uh, but yes, Mary smashed that slam that we held as part of our Fringe run that year. It was tremendous. She is uh, an amazing poet. She is more than qualified uh, to judge. Joining her, we have the spectacular Beck Sherwood! No! Damn it! Damn it! I did so good last month. Beck's got married. Beck's been good! Thanks, I do. <laughs> that would make things easier for me. Uh, <laughs> no, we're very happy for Bex. I nailed it last month and it was newer then. What's happening? Drinking backstage. Uh, but yes, Bex Bidgood is part of the team here at I Am Loud, at Loud Poets. They're a tremendous poet. They have been to all of the, the, the slams and the shows we've been putting on this year. They are more than qualified to, to judge the poets. Uh, and joining Mary and Bex, we have the fantastic Matt Abbott! Matt is someone I have been so, so keen to get up on a Loud Poet stage for a very long time. I am a huge fan of his work as a poet and a promoter and all the wonderful things he does in the poetry scene as he tries not to make direct eye contact with me because he's embarrassed by what I'm saying. But we're very, very pleased to have him here. He, he is not only going to be our judge this evening, but he is going to be our sacrificial poet. That's right. A surprise for Matt. We're going to murder him. Uh, <laughs> bring out the pyre! <laughs> Shouldn't have come to Scotland, mate. It's weird up here. <laughs> we got our own slam rules. Uh, no, uh, we, we have a sacrificial poet. If you've never been to a slam, it is very hard being the first poet up at the mic uh, to, to kind of warm up the crowd like this crowd needs it. Uh, so Matt is going to take that bullet. He is going to be the first poet up to, to kind of shake off some of the dust in the room. Uh, yeah, that is going to be wonderful. Those are our three judges and our wonderful sacrificial poet. Uh, our 12 slammers who are scattered around the stage, uh, they are all going to come up. In the first round, they will have three minutes at the mic. Each one of them will read. We will whittle that down or the judges will, I have nothing to do with this. Uh, they will whittle it down to six poets. We'll have a little break. When we come back from the break, we will announce the six poets through to the second round. And then we will go into uh, our third round where there will be only three poets, the three finalists. And they will be joined by the wonderful Jack Hinks, who is our resident musician. Give it up for Jack Hinks. <laughs> yes, more Jack. Uh, so yes, uh, they will have three three minutes each of those rounds uh, to wow you with their poetic prowess. It'll be lovely. Uh, so that is the way it will work. They are all worrying about scores and poems and rounds and formats and music and all of that. That's all their stuff to worry with. I don't want you guys to worry at all about the points because the point is not the points. The point is the poems. Uh, that is what you guys are here for. Uh, the poets, this is a scary thing to do. Some of these poets will have been performing for years. They might have done a million slams. Some of them, it might be a handful of their first gigs, maybe their first slam that they've ever taken part in. So I don't want you to judge them. I want you to love them, to give them all of the support. Absolutely. I was going to ask if you could do that. I feel... I feel you might be capable. Uh, yeah, it's going to be amazing. I want you to give that love to each and every slammer as they get up to the mic to perform because it is a real scary thing. You are like, a, you might not know this, but with the lights, you're just like a dark blob screaming at me, <laughs> which I fucking love, uh, but might terrify some other people so uh, who aren't quite the narcissist I am. Uh, <laughs> one person who's like, yeah, narcissist, yeah. <laughs> Hey, if the shoe fits, wear it, I say. Uh, guys, so that is how the evening is going to work. Three rounds, 12 poets, three judges, spectacular evening in store. Guys, are you ready for the Central Heat? Yeah! 
Oh. Then I will read out the names in the order they are going to appear. What we will do, we will do one big cheer at the end of the names. <laughs> I get you're excited. <laughs> we'll be here all fucking night. Uh, so one big cheer at the end of the names, all right? So, slamming, in the order they will come to the mic for the first round, we have George Bartlett McNeil, Lorna Callery Sioli, Lara, fuck that, Lara, <laughs> drinking backstage, Lara, Lara Delmage, Beth Godfrey, Sarah Grant, Joe Hunter, Spencer Mason, Lucy May, Tabo Mukulabati, Colin Nelson, Fimo H. Peel, and Oren Thompson! <laughs> We're six slams in. I always tell people, we'll do one big cheer at the end. You are the first crowd who have stored up each individual cheer and delivered them as one. That is fucking exceptional. Uh, I am thrilled. Guys, you're going to be an amazing audience. Uh, I cannot wait to kick off this slam. We have one final ingredient, our wonderful sacrificial poet. Please make all the noise. Give all the love for the wonderful Mabbit! <laughs> It's 5 a.m. in January, and the sky is a mineshaft. We're on the outskirts of Calais, and sleep is at a premium. They almost look like fireworks, but they're heading for the ground, these canisters of CS gas designed to make you weep. From the fog above a swamp to a thick and creamy cloud, by the dozen load, the landing in the center of the crowd. Heartbeats quadruple with the rocket's downward arc. Blue lights, white smoke, red sparks. Folk disperse like pool balls on a break. As distant smartphones follow it like snipers. Woolly hats and flip-flops taking cover where they can. The odd ironic cheer preceding chaos. The National Guard are going hard on unarmed refugees, ignoring shrieks of panic, humanitarian pleas. In riot gear, they circle the perimeter like sharks. Blue lights, white smoke, red sparks. Blinded bodies dodge between grenades that cause concussion. If they're lucky, then the next lot might land on that tarpaulin. A well-prepared assault from the safety of the shadows. No warning, no discussion, no mercy. Between businesses and hand-built homes, it suddenly feels like trenches. Rubber bullets pummel flesh, the water cannon drenches. An air raid in the dead of night just bites. No barks, blue lights, white smoke, red sparks. Blue lights, white smoke, red sparks. <laughs> So, you know, no pressure, poets. Uh, that's, uh, that's amazing. What a way to kick off the slam. Guys, are you ready for round one? <laughs> On deck, we have Lorna, but kicking off the slam, please give all the love to Georgia Bartlett McNeil. <laughs> Hola. Me llamo Georgia. Yo tengo 28 años. Yo quiero aprender español porque my blood sometimes sings songs in languages I don't really understand. So I'm making the effort to learn, trying to wrap my head around a ballet my tongue seems to have inherited a rhythm for, but the rest of me was only blessed with two left feet. No proficiency. I did study French as a child, Mais je ne sais pas si cette langue fits me quite right. C'est une belle langue, but it isn't mine. I know the people who live where some of my history stems from speak in that tongue now, but I, I only know the rudimentary steps of its dance through my enforced juvenile practice sessions. French is ballet, soft yet dripping with solid intent. Spanish is flamenco, wild and free and heavy with rhythmical passion. And you got to admit, that sounds more like me. 
I am a melting pot of history, living proof that too many cooks do not in fact spoil the broth, pero todo tiene un papel a jugar. Everyone adds their own touch, their own sweetness or spice, azúcar y especia. A few years back, I did my 23 and Me, and I can say categorically that I am 100% mixed race. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> If you want to break that down to calculate it out, it amounts to 50% British and Irish, 30% West African, 15% Levantine, that's Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and most of Turkey. And then there's 5% left to mop up the dregs of me, but half of that, half of that, la mitad de esto es español. Mi madre mapeo sus genes también. Su española suma un siete por ciento. Mi abuela doble de nuevo. Only a couple generations further back to go until we find her. La encina. The pure Spanish root in our family tree. It may be a he. Given our history, it's probably a he. But somehow, I don't imagine a man. Instead, I see a woman with dark eyes, dark curls, and the brightest smile, who looks just a little something like me. On deck, we have Lara, but please keep that applause going as we welcome Lorna Callanay St. Holly! <laughs> the lights are bright. <laughs> Strange fruits. On a scale of one to ten, how black is your husband? He is black. Black as riverbed rocks, orchard shadows, an ebony lake. Black as bass notes of music played during midnight serenades. Black as sooty lashes, an evening coat, grit on the road. Black as deep sea echoes, sheer shadows on crests of waves. Black as interstellar of whoosh, whispered softly. Black as my pleasure. Black as midnight, the pupil of your iris, storm clouds overhead. Black as alchemist fire, transforming dark matter into gold that sits at the ends of rainbows. Black as the panther who fought for freedom when black was something other. Black as creation. Black as your ancestors, black as perfection. Black as a black hole to another dimension where black is white and white is black. On deck, we have Beth Godfrey, but coming to the stage now, please welcome Lana Dama! It is bright. Hi. So um, my poem is about being bisexual and how people say that we're greedy because we are, and I don't really get why that's... <laughs> supposed to be a read? I don't know. And it's also about how when you're bisexual and you're in a straight relationship, you're still really gay. Um, it's called Very. I'm gonna have my phone just in case, because this is my first slam. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very. Bisexual. Why sexual? Suppress, sigh, sexual. Just another guy, sexual. Thigh high, oh my, sexual. You taste like the sea, sexual. Oyster, mussel, and salt, sexual. Whistle through the window, sexual. Didn't realize we had a draft, still sexual. That curve of your ass, still sexual. Green, bounce off red, sexual. Kisses on the head, sexual. 
never out of bed sexual sleep when you're dead sexual how sexual bisexual very on deck we have beth but uh, sarah but coming to the stage now, please give all the love to Beth Godfrey. A crumb falls from his fingers suspended. It hits the floor and her pores flush. Spit meets grit, a kind of sandpaper, taste buds scouring for flavor. Maybe later. Desperate eyes dart back to the mouthful, hopeful, still poised mid-air, she stares. He's unaware, or doesn't care, he hasn't glanced this way once despite her earnest begging gaze, and in a mouthful it's all gone, and she'll lick the plate for the remblant, mem- remblants, the semblance of a meal. But she doesn't want to steal, she wants something real, to be invited. And despite this, she hovers, ready to hoover, and he having cleared his plate, dissipates, leaving her staring into space, ravenous. She has been a dog, waiting for crumbs, too many times, never offered a seat at the table. The forces that shaped her from a young age have left her wanting, always wanting the male gaze, a seal of approval, deifying the conscious man's mind, as if only he has eyes to see and time to give to mirror her, to fill the insatiable hole, and intellectually the belief another soul can make us whole, can steady our shit, is bullshit. But I know half of us are looking for someone, something to rescue us, From what? Ourselves? And she only lingered because there was that rare spark that catches your heart off guard, the kind of potential that scares you, that makes you emit light. And it wasn't like they hadn't feasted together, she had just done it again, found someone whose interest would wane, who wasn't available or ready to leap. I mean, she dreamt about him once and there was rotting meat. But they always seem to find her. It's a story that arrives unbidden, ready to be rewritten, and she's trying. Because the truth is, she is the feast. The life she's built with her friends is sticky with flavour. There's wine and healing herbs they found. They break bread, greasy-fingered, and laugh and pass food around. Everyone brings a dish. It's not fancy, but it's rich because they listen and are present. Voices breaking as they break open. Belly laughter has them snorting, mouths frozen open, eyes spilling over as they feel transparent with love. They dance on her table at the joy of being enough, of being alive, of the overflow that happens when you know and grow into each other and yet she'd been sat at their feet satisfied with crumbs numb to the rest of her life but attention will always be crumbs when you're outsourcing it from yourself on deck we have joe hunter but coming to the stage right now please give all the love to Sarah Gray! I pull sticky hands into the sleeves of my wee coat as she beats her stick on the ground and croaks. Hurry up, hen, I'm no waiting forever. <laughs> Maisie is my father's great aunt, a cantankerous old witch, twitching her eye and roller stuck to the back of her head came out the womb fag in hand. <laughs> A chimney stack birth, starting fires with her every breath and it only gets worse from there. Born and bred in Glasgow West, my babysitter, my tutor, her stories were always the best. This poem will never do her justice, but I have to try. So this is the story of Maisie and how Maisie died. (laughs) My first memory of her, we were shopping for a coat, but Maisie had this big dowager's hump and I didn't know why. So when my Auntie Caroline said without thinking, how about a nice camel coat, Maisie? I was taught how to say, fuck off, eat shit and die. (laughs) 
Her husband Huey was a tugboat captain with a port in every harbour. Two families that knew nothing about each other. He went first. And as he lay waiting to die, Maisie sat munching on four mince pies. <laughs> as he fought his last, she leaned close in and chucked her dear old husband on the chin and said, keep your pecker up, shug. <laughs> and left. <laughs> Seven years old, I sat in the living room waiting for the call to say he died. She says, aye, that's him away. <laughs> and looks me dead in the eye and goes, I won. <laughs> Maisie blazed her way through her life, living in her liquor. The next dance was always a fight. Swearing was punctuation and she always had a light. I'll never forget that March night. Gathered round her hospital bed as every fag she ever smoked rattled through the room. She once fought to speak. She, the mask came off and she says, I think I've shot myself. <laughs> and her daughter leans in and goes, no, mum, that was me. I just farted. <laughs> Maisie croaks, ah, dirty bastard. <laughs> and died. <laughs> My dad let out the tiniest giggle. <laughs> and the walls came down with me in the middle. The nurses burst in, drawn by her roars to see us rolling around and howling like pack animals calling her home as she drifted off on our mirth. And we started telling stories of Maisie and her chimney stack birth. And I want to live like my Auntie Maisie. I want to blaze my way through my limited days. I want to be an absolute menace and make you <laughs> laugh with my every sentence. I'm going to the grave with a mocking bow and a wonky oxygen mask stuck to my brow. If I kick the bucket, don't waste your tears. Just piss your pants over our memories and years. If I go tomorrow, that is okay with me because I've made you laugh and you have made me so happy. And somewhere out there, Maisie beats her stick on the ground and she still waits for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have I've heard I've heard a lot of poems about grief and I, do, I I don't know I don't know whether it's it's that poem or this audience but I've I've never been so I've heard someone whoop at the, and how Maisie died one person at the back went hey God bless you guys <laughs> we carry on guys we are going to have a uh, uh, we are going to have Spencer on deck, but coming to the stage now, please give all the love to the wonderful Joe Hunter! You know the drill with these things. Tinder, grinder, bumble, bam, match, playful banter, a bus to yours, and the buzzer sings. Like the bell sounding rounds in a wrestling ring, and they kiss you. Before you can even blink, you giggle, say hello, offer a drink, they say no, so you just sink into each other, smothered, but not in a claustrophobic way. You sweat, squirm, assume new shapes like aerobics, but gay. <laughs> Err. And before you know it, it's over, and they bid you good day, and you are left again. Once more, you've lost something that never belonged to you, but you are still bereft again. And I don't ask for a lot. It takes a soft word and a gentle touch before feelings are caught. But God, give me something more than the literal. Pump me poetically. <laughs> you know, dark and urgent, yet tender and lyrical. I want you to give me an ounce of you. Because right now, I am giving you all that I am. I am giving you it to the point that I won't be able to stand. I am giving you everything because then there is nothing left for you to take. If I give you my body to bruise, brand and embellish, then there is nothing left for you to break. Because pain doesn't hurt if it's asked for. When you decide how long it lasts for, when you decide what marks are past, or what names, what scratches, what parts, what patches of my body I have given you permission to claim. I'm not saying that you don't treat me well, I'm just saying that after I'd like to be held. Because I just did something monumental for you, that at one point I thought that I couldn't. Because it was taken from me when I said that I wouldn't. But 
I have emerged like a phoenix from the ashes, a beautiful, proud, worthwhile whore. I do not care if it is a mattress, a table, the storytelling center, bathroom, or the floor. Because I am celebrating myself and my autonomy. I am celebrating the fact that these decisions once again belong to me. I am celebrating the guilt and shame that have since passed. I am celebrating by letting someone come and... Never mind. Look, I will be whatever you need. Your daddy, dommy, degradee, your hogtied, whore, tied lock and key, your simple, savage, submissive slut, your freak of nature, feral mutt, your good girl, your bad boy, your polypansexual piss kink toy, your filthy fuck, cum bucket, masochist, piece of shit, player, primal polygamist, your animal enraged, monster in cage, stage for all to see, exhibitionist, voyeur, your incompetent intern, your demanding employer, your demon daydream creature of the night, your your love, your heart, your soul, your light, your pure spirit, your pure dirty bastard. I will be your everything as long as you kiss me after. Thank you. So, so I have been hosting shows for almost 10 years, poetry shows. I've never had to say this before. Please don't fuck in the bathroom. <laughs> we like it here at the Storytelling Center. <laughs> we would love to be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous stuff. Guys, we are halfway through and I can already feel the hatred from the judges. I really hope the last six of you are terrible. Uh, that, that'd take a lot of pressure off me from this general area. Guys, I know they're not going to be. It's infuriating. Please give all the love. Welcome to the stage. The wonderful Spencer Mason! <laughs> a smile like the screech needing unplugged before the microphone is even switched on. Yes, I am the graveled fraction of a voice unstayed, no matter the mortar nor meter of the wall. A patchwork scrapbook, my forearm telling of more lives than many bipeds have lived and donned in the grin of someone who expects to not be accepted. Yes. Skin surfaced as the moon, each callous and wart, a shining miracle from across the sticks. I am the roaring laugh on the post-pub trudge that cozies vertebra to the lane line. On that post-pub trudge, words smudge like a sucker punch filled with truth, filled with silence. And none like the silence of kissing your words back to your lung. Yes, silence. And witness this. I am the only one of my friends who can park a bus upon my face <laughs> with my aircraft carrier nose that guides iris like homing missiles, compliments on cruise control, yes, witness, as my helipad for hecklers makes harassments bounce harmlessly asunder, hoodlums brushing their tweet teeth with the pavement as they realise that I am the only one of my friends that can use my nose as a dildo. Yes, the only one with mere glance to make your girlfriend gasp orgasm. I am the stereotype hoodwinker, sucking sonnets and stanzas through a spliff as skimpy as I, and dawned in that grin, dawned in that grin, oh witness, as I trudge through the gaff in Gucci garments, all gallus in a half-smoked wrap, here I stand. Thank you. We have Tabo on deck, but coming to the stage now, please give all the love, make all the noise for Lucy May! breathe out now. <laughs> this is my skin that you see me in. 
and I live and I breathe and I twist and I weave my breath, my air, my body, my hair. This is my skin. Those marks you see are part of me. The hairs that grow are mine to show or hide. My skin is mine. And it may burn, it may fade, may wrinkle, decay, it gets spots, it cracks, it freckles. And that is part of what my skin should do. Protects and shields and lives life through. My skin is what I'm standing in. It's delicate, soft, and tough as hell. My skin is mine. And here you see me standing in my skin, my skin that I live in, that I choose to show as much as I want, without invitation, as much as I want, I'll show not yours to behold, but mine. So see it my skin, see it. I chose to show what I choose to show. And you'll see what I share as it's mine to lay bare, as it's mine to withhold in body and in soul, in cloth or on show. My skin is mine. My skin is mine. On deck, we have Colin Nelson, but please help me welcome to the microphone the amazing Tabo Mokolobate! Yo, if you could help me with this one. So each time I raise my hand up high, all you gotta shout is say, say what? So every time I raise my hand up high, all you need to do is shout, say what, as loud as you can. Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> It's quite impossible to understand the full nature of poets from a human perspective. It's quite impossible to understand the full nature of poets from a human perspective. In my village, cutting living wood is forbidden. We gather the dead wood and congregate around campfire every evening. Listening to my grandmother's stories makes us feel alive. She speaks poetry. It is her celestial language. Casts her faith among still waters and the universe conspires in her favor. Speaks poetry. Gathers herself in many ways. Speaks poetry whenever she prays. Her language is sacred. The soul rhymes with each syllable like an act without exhaustion. It is in her posture. Speaks Poetry, the Christ embodied, exists in her body. It is life in its purest form. She speaks a result of an explosive, divine, pure, holy, divine, beyond the sacred knowledge of time. Her beauty multiplies and through the horizon's demise. Only a few exist of her kind. The journey's a sign. I have heard of her beauty for once. The columns were right. Born from catastrophic events, listening to her words makes us relive the moments that cannot be ignored. It is like picking through God's keyhole. She possesses the ability to connect a torn sequel. This is not just poetry. It is her heart and sweat. This is what she bleeds. When it hurts, it is quite impossible to understand the full nature of poets from a human perspective. Say what? What? I have never been more certain that audience interaction would work than I am this evening. Guys, please keep that applause going. Build it all the way back up. Go absolutely wild for Colin Nelson. This is a trilogy of frank reviews of underwhelming snacking foods. <laughs> One, a spiced meat tube. Behold yon slender flesh truncheon, forged from the motley flotsam of an abattoir gutter. A nightmarish pick and mix of glutinous wibbly bits, forcibly stripped from the carcasses of mechanically slaughtered swine. 
a cartilaginous agglomeration of snouts, trotters, and little curly tails, all ground and bound into an impossibly dense gristle totem. <laughs> Lubricated in a putrid serum, distilled from the flash-boiled fear sweat of shrieking porcine victims. I give ye the bastard hate child of a turd and a salami. <laughs> the foul and loathsome pepperami. <laughs> Two. A sugar-free adulteration of a warmly regarded butterscotch candy. I dub thee abomination. Certes, thou wearest the golden trappings of thy fairer, sweeter sibling, but I know thee to be false. <laughs> Insincere, saccharine, liar. <laughs> On the tongue, a bitter aftertaste. Bitter as the forlorn tears of an overlooked orphan. <laughs> and thy texture, oh, let us speak of thy texture. For thou art smooth, aye, and creamy, forsooth. <laughs> creamy as pus. <laughs> that hot, viscous liquor learnt straight from the burning heart of an inflamed rectal abscess. <laughs> oh, but this is mere prologue to the, to the litany of thy sins. But I shall relent. Wanting only for time to fully elucidate thine obscenities innumerable. But know this, O oh gold-clad villain, with my being's every fibre do I abhor thee, Werther's original sugar-free. <laughs> Three. An individually wrapped luncheon cheese. Thou twice armoured fiend. <laughs> Sheathed first in wax and then in plastic to hide thy pale, claggy mass. Clot of congealed smegma. <laughs> siphoned from twixt the glands of a grotesque demon's pustulant phallus. A tumour, bland and beige, vile cancer of the snack world, and gross affront to cheeses everywhere. You red-robed charlatan. <laughs> Preaching lies and malice like the fallen priest of a long-forgotten elder god. Would that I could consign thee to the lowest circle of hell, thou thrice-accursed baby bell. Thank you. <laughs> See, it slams. I, I don't normally like plug the participants' stuff, you know, like books and stuff, but I, I do feel obliged to point out that Colin is available for children's parties. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's at all interested in that. Uh, <laughs> Guys, we have two more slammers in the first round. Are you ready for your slammers? <laughs> then please help me welcome to the stage the fabulous Thebo HP. It's going to be really hard to do this because I'm still giggling. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with the eyes. You say, locking mine. Your hands reach for my neck slowly, and I gasp. The sharp intake of air sets mind racing, microscopic detail my only anchor. Your wide, nimble fingers, nails perfectly manicured, strong blonde hairs jutting from each knuckle, rustling beneath constricted breath like ante antenna signaling anticipation. With parental t intimacy, you tug away the poorly made knot, unwinding my carelessness and expectation. You have to picture the knot you want, the soft swish of silk pulling through silk. Visualize the man you want to be, the man you want people to see. 
the gentle rub of fabric sliding back and forth a sensual halo around my neck. I watch you work in the mirror, hands spell casting, weaving fabric in and out. I hope you don't see me blush, swooning at you, Shifu, Lama, Master, Commander. You canter in homily about artistry and the splendor of artifice in a world loathsome of deviance. You've got to shape the knot. You're crafting a fantasy. Blood crescendos as your work abates, hands firmly secured at my collar. You place one finger above my jugular notch and press, gently squeezing the sides of my binding. A perfect dimple forms at the center and the lingering scent of you, talc and saffron, the finishing touch. This is a man, you say, your hands braced on my shoulder. And you leave me there, bound, ready for work. This not a perfect monument to tenderness. It's one of the reasons I love slams so very much. When would you get those two acts? Back to back, other than that, a poetry slam. Good shit. Hey, guys, we have one final act. Screw saving anything for the second half. Give it all now. Pour out all the love. Make all the noise. Welcome to the stage, Horan Thompson! Thank you. Jesus, you really, really are a blob. Um, this is about meeting someone and connecting with them. I've been waiting for the moment to ask you, See if we've the same point of view. I wonder if it's flown right past you or grown into a stone in your shoe. I think maybe you are my first. I think that brings on expectations. I think there are folk on this earth creating this state of elation. I think it takes lots of healing. Discomfort is always weird. When you look at me, do you get that feeling? From the tips of my toes to my face and my beard, and I tip to and fro from just knowing and fear, I think I need you to be honest. If you let me in, I'll be gentle. I'm here, so trust me. I'm ready. I promise. Do you think that you, we, you, you uh, are trans? <laughs> A big bender, not here for surrender, but gracing mere mortals with mayhem and splendor. Are they them? A gay trend, that Dorothy's pal, a modern minority live carnival. <laughs> a snap at a poem, a sunflower growing, because I have an inkling. Alarm bells are twinkling that we have a sprinkling of trans on our plate. You've spent too much time in my presence to date, but my dear, no, this isn't a blunder. You remind me of me when I was younger. Grab manhood by the balls and make it so pretty and purchase a binder to hold in your feelings. <laughs> anyway, uh, you, you are revealing your structural sparkle, delivered with flair, fierce, not patriarchal. I'm far from impartial, I know, but I marvel at watching you wrap up your personhood parcel. Startled? Yes, I would be too. Apologies. You're my first baby trans, after all, and I'm honoured to be at your service. Yes, maybe we're damned to be small five foot four, but if there's joy to be felt, let's preserve it. I am a bit strong. This I'll concede the joyful stampede. Have you disagreed? I'm kidding. Well, kind of. You, sir, take the lead. I'm your noble steed if you choose to proceed, and maybe we'll bleed in the streets. Blood with pride glitter, pins, glamour banners. But the things we'll do in the sheets are of a far more personable manner. Yes, deflecting trauma with humour. A quirk. I see your veiled smirk. A thing you'll learn to work, but no matter how dark, how battered, how weathered, what trans people do is hell. We'll laugh together. And I think that's maybe my point. Have a solidarity preview. Whatever you do, you can't disappoint. Whatever you'll be. I will see you. Thanks.
Guys, can we just get a big round of applause for all of our slammers? That is, uh, that has got to be one of the most high caliber first rounds of a slam I think I've ever seen. Uh, guys, what we are going to do um, is take a little break, uh, about 15, 20 minutes. You can go recharge your glasses, have a cigarette, I don't know, fucking scream into the void, whatever you do. Uh, <laughs> so I know that's what I'll be doing. Uh, uh, that's not true. I will be getting mugged by three very angry judges. Uh Whoops, <laughs> guys, uh, this is, I, I have been saying it this whole uh, sort of season long, slams are kind of one of the first things I encountered when I came into the poetry scene, and they've kind of petered off a little bit over the last few years, they haven't seemed to be such a big focal part of the scene, but doing this slam series uh, this year, and the sort of six slams that we've run, it has been incredible to see the caliber of performance, uh, every one of the heats has been way above my expectations, and tonight was no different, I know the Edinburgh Scene is very established compared to some, but that has, has raised it to the central belt. Sorry, not just Edinburgh. There's, there's <laughs> pipe down, all right? Feel, think how fucking Inverness feels, okay? <laughs> Glasgow can deal with it for a minute. Uh, <laughs> No, no, but it is. It's incredible to see all over the country. It's been wonderful. And in the Central Belt, there is so much talent and it is such an established scene, but this has raised the bar even more. I, I know it has been spectacular. I know whoever wins this evening, and it really fucking could be anyone, uh, is going to represent this, the whole Central Belt. <laughs> admirably uh, at, at the EIBF. Uh, and I, I think uh, the, the nice thing about slams, slams only suck to lose when you feel you should have won them. And I think whoever doesn't make it through the second round will know that there is probably a fraction of a point between it. Because uh, that was such, such a stellar uh, first round. So just one more time, up for the poets. So uh, you can uh, you can head upstairs, get a drink and all that. We have a merch stand upstairs. If you want to keep in touch with what we're doing, spoken word and all that stuff, there is a mailing list. You can sign up to our fabulous Judge Bex. Uh, compiles a list of spoken word events all over the UK, even Glasgow. Uh, so <laughs> if you want to find spoken word where you are, then please do sign up to the mailing list and we'll get that out to you and stuff. But for now, go have a drink, go get some air, and we will see you in about 15, 20 minutes. All right, thank you guys. See you in the second half. Welcome back to the second half of Loud Poets. Please clap your hands, stamp your feet, and make some noise for your host and compare, Kevin McLean. Hello, 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 welcome back to the second Always a good sign when the audience makes it back from the interval. Fantastic. Did everyone get a beverage? Yeah. Oh dear, fuck. Yeah. Most audiences, I'm like, good, they'll be a bit looser in the second half. <laughs> You guys have been amazing, genuinely. It means the world to us. Uh, people, a, a nice big room full packed of people coming out to see some poetry. Uh, that is a rarer thing than you might expect. Uh, so it is wonderful. Thank you so much for being such a spectacular audience. Guys, did you enjoy the first round? Yeah. Me too. It was quite good. Uh, I, I like doing a bit of chit chat here and a bit of waffle because I can feel the stares of the poets. <laughs> Just tell us who's fucking through. Uh, I will. I will. I won't. <laughs> Fuck, they're on the stage. I'm in the danger zone. Normally there's like distance. Uh, uh, yes, uh, just to reiterate, um, like there are fractions of points in it. I got a stern talking to from Bex uh, about how hard this was to judge. It is, it is a, a thankless task. Can we just get a big round of applause for our judges? <laughs> Because it really is a fucking abysmal thing to have to to try and do, uh, and and like I know it will have been, you know, you all saw the first round. You know how good everyone is. It was it was pretty spectacular. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the six poets who are through to the second round. I will read their names in the order that they will be reading, and we will do one big round of applause <laughs> at the end. Uh, that's how it works. You guys have got this. You're you're a panto crowd, but you're disciplined. Uh, <laughs> which I respect. 
<laughs> militarized panto crowd. Uh, <laughs> I drank during the half as well. <laughs> It's a slam. We're having fun. Uh, cool. So that is what I will do. I will read out those six names in the order that they will be coming to the mic. And then what we're going to do is introduce our wonderful sacrificial poet back onto the stage for a kind of feature set, which will give our six poets a chance to kind of compose themselves, frantically decide what poem to do next and get over the shock of making it out of that tight 12. Uh, that was crazy. So the six poets going through to the second round in the order they will read are... Colin Nelson. <laughs> One fucking job. <laughs> Don't let the poets lead you astray. <laughs> Pay no attention to the poets. Uh, no, uh, so <laughs> Colin Nelson. Good. <laughs> Now it's like weirdly, weirdly charged. Uh, <laughs> hey, Tabo Mokolo. Oh, no, fuck that. That's because no one's clapping. Uh, I normally shout into the screams. Tabo, Spencer, Joe, Sarah, and Georgia are our six poets into the final round. Second round. Did you see me staring at that bit of paper, making sure I wasn't having a fucking Oscars moment? Uh, <laughs> yes, no, uh, incredible job from the six poets who made it through to the second round. Can we just get a big round of applause for all of our first round poets? I was I was talking to uh, Matt during the interval uh, about how annoyed he was at the judging, uh, but also uh, about how like amazing not only the quality of the first round was but the range of like subjects and tone and genre and just everything about it and uh, if you followed slam as closely as i have for the last sort of 10 years and you look at somewhere like the north american kind of slam scene and what it's created this sort of homogenized voice where it's just kind of every poem sounds the same and there's this recipe for slam success and one of the things that makes me so so happy over here in the uk is that has not happened like you can see that from the first round the the range uh, of things that are being discussed and you can see that and who moves into the the first round the, the second round there is no recipe for success every form of poetry every genre is welcome and i think that is just awesome about slam and about spoken word in general i say it all the time you can go to a comedy night and get one response over and over and over and that is wonderful but it is samey whereas you come to a spoken word show and you get you know one moment you are disgusted by baby bells <laughs> And then you black out for a moment and come back and you get something totally different, you know, something beautiful and imagery laced. And that is like just such a, a wonderful thing about it. So just give it up for poetry. <laughs> Poems. Guys, I am so, so excited to have our sacrificial poet here, but there is one missing ingredient, and that is the spectacular Mr. Jack Higgs. <laughs> All right, he's okay. Yeah, no, no, we love Jack Hanks. <laughs> the fabulous Jack Hanks is our resident loud musician. He is uh, a feature part of all of our shows, uh, providing musical accompaniment to all our wonderful poets. And in the third round of the Slam, not to get too ahead of ourselves, but in the third round, the three finalists will be accompanied by Jack. Uh, they will get to give him three word prompt, and then he will do music magic around their poem uh, and it'll be wonderful but we figured it might be a bit much to just kind of throw the poets into the deep end of that uh, so uh, during Matt's uh, feature set we're going to have him uh, have at least a, sort of one of his poems where he'll have accompaniment by the beautiful Jack Hanks but for now into the darkness with you Jack <laughs> you think I wouldn't do it because it's the slam it's my favorite bit uh, Guys, uh, I'm so excited to have our feature poet here, our, our, our sacrificial poet, our wonderful slam judge. Uh, he is the the brain, the host behind uh, Nimson Thugs. He, I've been a huge fan of his for a long, long time. He's a stalwart of the scene, a fantastic voice. Please go absolutely wild for the wonderful Matt Abbott! It's all right. 
I am, he gurns and he regurgitates the sun. An argument where both sides have already won. He rolls his eyes, and then a cigarette, and then a five pound note. Glares at me, emboldened by the outcome of a vote. His fingerprints say steelworks. My fingerprints say coal. The careers advisor pretty much said call centre or dull. This lad and me were a mirror, but it's well and truly shattered. Council estate, Teesside, in a kitchen getting battered. He says Brexit's fine, Britain needs to knuckle down and persist. And then he tells me I'm a snowflake and that food banks don't exist. I'm a scaremonger, a sore loser. Socialism's fucked, don't matter who's in charge, mate. They're all a bunch of crooks. Warm cans of carlin, stubble around as lips. Fred Perry made the wardrobe, Shane Meadows wrote the script. Worlds apart, polarised, his jaw slowly clenches. Social civil war, as always, in the trenches. He didn't channel racism, Islam, immigration. He talked of being lost at sea, drowning in frustration. Listen, mate, I agree, a decade sick to death. It's a salty dish to swallow when austerity is the chef. Folk come and go, they decline to interject. We're discussing politics, they're happy getting wrecked. A carousel of snide retorts from dehydrated throats. He rolls his eyes, and then a cigarette, and then a five pound note. Cheers. Um, see, I'm English, it's all everyone, anyone talks about down there. And also, I'm Northern, we fucking loved it. Um, no, sorry, I just, I, I did, I, you, you get the, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having us. Like, I was, uh, it was really difficult to judge, to be a judge in that first round. Even more so knowing that I'd have to come and do a feature slot doing a feature set and also when all the points are sat around me as well like it's <laughs> fuck um yeah no it's, i'm really excited to be here um uh, roddy i'm gonna do the the tune with jack next if that's if that's cool um because jack needs a little bit of light to play his instrument he's not he's he's, he's pretty good but he can't do it in the pitch black <laughs> so <laughs> so the idea is that we give uh three words uh the three words that i'm going to give you are bleak Stoned lullaby. I don't have much more in my locker, to be honest with you. <laughs> and because it's been accompanied by a musician, I'm going to read it from my book. Just cause to <laughs> make it feel like I'm, you know. Okay. In the car park, by the quayside, as dark as it's going to get, hatchbacks are gathered like the closing frames of snooker. Girls giggle in harmony with the odd nocturnal seagull and headlamps are a form of winking from a distance. Hot box or hand jobs or simply passing time. The juvenile adrenaline that comes with petty crime. Too young and too broke to try and chance it in the bars. So Friday's misdemeanors come in neon coloured cars. This is where Maria met Steve. She was 17, he was 23. A Kermit coloured Cleo on a double date with Kirsty. It's funny, the more you drink, the more it makes you thirsty. Five years and a fortnight since he drove her back to his. He promised her something special, but she's yet to discover what it is. So, she plans to just let her hair grow for a bit. Use a £20 note as a bookmark in a Sylvia Plath. Let Stephen paint her toenails as he watches Match of a Day and then stretch out in a Pikachu onesie. He makes the greatest brew on earth, that boy. Two sugars and the shade of orangutan whiskers. They have to swim the channel just to try and pay the rent. A fortnight with a microscope and every penny spent before they plummet with the pressure and it's plundered by a drug. A spliff instead of breakfast or red wine from a mug. But with phones stuck in flight mode, and the door's double locked. There's nothing in the world beats the comfort of this bubble. And as Netflix babysits the bits that drag and drift between the shifts, her eyes evade the calendar and all she's ever dreamt of. Because it's easier to compromise than pursue. It's easier to accept than to challenge. It's easier to recalibrate than to truly stick to your guns. The last time she checked, there was no parachute button on the Virgin TiVo remote. So, she plans to just let her hair grow for a bit and fall asleep with Sylvia singing lullabies from the page.
Thanks, mate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, so I'm going to do um, a poem now, which is about uh, the national flag of the UK, right, uh, the Union flag. Now, uh, I did this a couple of years ago on stage in Glasgow, and what I used to do when I did this poem was I used to get, like, a copy of a flag, like, an actual flag out, and, like, hold it up and perform the poem, because it's about the flag. I'm not a pro. I'm, I'm not... You'll see what I mean, right? But I did it on a Friday night in Glasgow, and very nearly... Uh, <laughs> So I decided to leave a flag at home. Um, but look, I'm not going to do too much intro, but a thousand people can see that flag and have a thousand different reactions. Or the same person can see it in a hundred places. Anyways, it's called Red, White and Blue. I put more effort into the poem than the title. Here we go. The Britpop snarl. Jerry's dress. Cool Britannia. Girl power. Shaking hands with Tony Blair, the 90s finest hour. Nick Griffin's BMP from the ashes of the National Front. The Falklands Wars, up yours, Delors, the Boxing Day Hunt. Contextual chameleon, so keen to misconstrue. Polarised reactions to red, white and blue. Winston Churchill, Austin Powers, Michael Caine, bouncing bombs. Rangers fans at Ibrox, the last night of the proms. Flags beside the railway line, Britannia Bar in Magaluf. Northern Ireland's marching season, soldiers sleeping rough. This flag is liberal guilt and pride and honour too. An ever crumbling union, red, white and blue. It flaps and drapes, emboldens, adorns, comforts, confronts, welcomes and warns, verifies, intimidates, emblazons, provokes. For some, it's nostalgia. For others, it chokes. Mods or monarchy, taint or teach, Buckingham Palace or Benidorm Beach, roadside burgers, readers, wives, Enid Blyton's famous five, tourism, paraphernalia, Boris Johnson's bumbling failure, car stickers, calf tattoos, coffins on the evening news. A reg plate on a lorry bound for Dover. An orphan's eyes fixated at a tunnel by the port. A victory lap for Team GB that Sunday night in Stratford. Families nationwide enraptured by a sport. From only fools and horses, Corey and Mr Bean to the savage all that came between. The great British bake-off, the crumbs of Enoch Powell. Squinting for a lounger in matching shorts and towel. A pin badge on a polo with braces and a Harrington on a skinhead in a flat roofed pub. A girl dressed in gingham with a little plastic flag for Jubilee in sepia in the local liberal club. If it's an emoji in your Twitter name, we probably disagree. <laughs> Bigots blurring boundaries should hate speech be free. I feel bad for saying I'm ashamed of it. I feel bad for saying I'm proud. Arms aloft chanting with my back towards the crowd. This flag is a threat. This flag is nostalgia. This flag is a privilege. This flag is my oppressor. This flag is law and order. This flag is an aggressor. Yeah, this flag is kicking off and this flag is clinging on. This flag is a pensioner that owns every swan. This flag is liberal guilt and pride and honour too. An ever crumbling union, red, white and blue. Royal weddings, fish and chips, Monty Python, Nelson ship, swinging 60s, Mersey beat, Dr. Martin's, Carnaby Street, who, jam, pistols, stones, made an oasis blur. Henman Hill, the telephone, shaken, not stirred. Fry ups in 40 degree sunshine. The Cockney rhyming slang, Blackpool illuminations. In 1966, it was a symbol of the times. Now it's mainly racist connotations. Oppressive rule of Ireland for 800 years. The invention of concentration camps, guns versus spears, rape, pillage, rule, ruin, educate, transform. Liberate from fascism, call migrants a swarm. The butcher's apron, the lonely yomper, unification, divide and conquer. This flag is liberal guilt and pride and honour too. An ever crumbling union, red, white and blue. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, yeah, even just if I... Oh, sorry. Even if I just held it up and someone took a picture and put it online without context, it was just, I stopped being booked for a long time. I was wondering why not. It's like, have you heard the poem? You haven't, you've seen it, it's fine. Anyways, um, so I started doing poetry when I was 17 and I never knew that poetry could be like this. And if I'd been to an event like this, it would have changed my life a lot sooner. But I got into it through music and uh, put some poems on MySpace. Don't know if you can remember, you know, you might have joined Threads, but remember MySpace. And um, 
some geezer found me and was like, look, I've got some instrumentals. You've got some poems. Do you want to put your, do you want to merge them and make songs? And I said, yeah, sure. And I was only a kid at the time. I was only 17. And within nine months, we'd signed a deal with Universal. Um, Cause we got all of it. I'm not bragging. It went to shit, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, the thing is though, like I was just, I was just, a, I was just a kid from Wakey and they'd, they'd signed me and they'd, they'd moved us down to London and they're taking us to all these parties and telling us they're going to make us the next big thing and all this shit. And uh, I was just living in London on my own, like trying to deal with it. And um, I'm going to do a poem now that I don't usually do because it was actually a lyric to a song, but I'm going to try and do it. And uh, I used to basically every day go to this place called Slim Jim's Liquor Store, which sounds really exciting and cool, but well. Old school jukebox. Crimson cracked leather stools, bare brick walls and neon lighting. Bras on the ceiling, exchanged for the fizz. An open door policy to all who like it hard and fast. Outside, Islington. Smokers shielding squinting eyes. Inside, oblivion. Flipping beer mats in solitude. Cyclists and cabbies, hostage to the heat. Flight mode and Bombay, drowning in defeat. My housemates swing by, try and get me to leave with them. They know that I had therapy today at 2pm. A job that neither wanted, reluctantly they goad. Forced to watch a car crash from the centre of a road. LA woman, light my fire, play it dumb and fight desire. Backdoor man, break on through, Mr Mojo, make on strew. A finger down the throat says you last till two. No natural lights, no clock, no clue. Love me two times, break on through, Mr Mojo, make on strew. And I fall. I fall down, down and out, but I love this place. And I drink here from 3 p.m. till, come on fella, let's be off till eyes glaze over and concrete feels soft. I'm 20 and I'm petrified, I'm levered and I'm lost, fleeing from reality regardless of the cost. Down and out in London, tumbler in my hand, fumbling through a summer that I'll never understand. A wallet stuffed with customer copies of card receipts. A clammy forehead, ten voicemails, a masterful purveyor of good times. The best. And I fall, I fall down, down and out. But I love this place. Thank you. Um, I think this will be my last one because I don't want we're a slam. It's a timed environment. I don't want to overrun my set, even though it's a feature set and not a slam. But I just right, we're all sticking to the time. I'm going to stick to mine. Right. The poem I did, the sacrificial poem at the start, was something that I wrote after I'd been at the a refugee camp in Calais, and I went to a, an event for the coal mining community, and as well as looking back on the history of the coal mining community, they also figure out how they can help other people. And I was taken over to Calais by some teachers to do poetry workshops in the jungle. And I never planned on going there and writing poetry about it, obviously. But having been there, I couldn't not. Um, so I'm gonna, my last poem is, is also about that. And it's uh, relevant with the news and all that. Just 22 miles. That's all it is. The sunlight bounces off the cliffs and because they're taller they look closer from France. I listen to the waves lapping over breakfast. I'd have a croissant and a coffee but I feel sick. I'm sure if you've traversed through continents and oceans you're going to look across and think I could swim that. The seagulls float gracefully in ravenous packs and my head's a fucking shed from all the parallels and chasms. David Williams, 10 hours 34, sport relief. Eurostar, one hour, 29 quid. Piano ferries, 90 minutes, 40 quid. Channel tunnel, 35 minutes, 49 quid. A smuggler's dinghy through the dead of night, up to 13 and a half thousand. Yesterday afternoon, I was sat playing cards with Ethiopians and Eritreans. The breeze picked up, so they invited me inside, into the home. And no word of a lie, right? No word of a lie, there was a Bradford City sleeping bag. Now, for those of you doing an internal shrug, there are 22 miles between their stadium and my home. It's the same between Leeds and York, between Newcastle and Hartlepool, Manchester and Blackburn, Birmingham and Leamington Spa, Northampton and Milton Keynes, Bristol and Newport, Oxford and Reading, Portsmouth and Bognor Regis, Romford and Southend, Calais, Calais and Dover. They ask me with wide eyes if Bradford are a decent team. I haven't got the heart to tell the truth. I want to ask them all how they got here, how long it took and how they managed, but that kind of thing is either volunteered or locked away. 
They offer me a cigarette and I smoke it just to socialise. I give them some euros to buy some beers and I'm Father Christmas. There are people who've walked across deserts, whose drivers were shot in the chest, whose dinghies were sinking and floated ashore, whose bodies were subjected to unspeakable acts. They burp with the beer and cheer with the cards. For a while it feels normal. The universal language of betting and banter, brotherhood forged in the belly of the beast, flags are now playful affiliation. The lad sat beside me, taps me on my knee, so I lean in and lend him my ear. He asks me, very gently, if I can justify why my country is leaving them here. His question somehow silences the room, playing cards stripped suddenly of worth. He's not asking me as a journalist or a lawyer, just a fellow human being on this earth. I feel sick again with shards of sunlight piercing through the roof. They ask me if they're likely to be welcomed in by law. And I haven't got the heart to tell the truth. Cheers. Thank you. Congratulations to all of them. Thank you. Can we also get a big round of applause for the wonderful Jack Higgs? Wow, what a feature set. Uh, you can see why I've been desperate to get that up for quite a while. Uh, those that have been coming along know that Kev has been working through his bucket list of poets since the lovely people at Creative Scotland gave him money to do so. Uh, this has been lovely. Ten years of building up names that I wanted to bring in. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you so much to, to Matt for coming up and giving us such a fantastic feature set and for the, doing the judging. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm going to get such a hard time in the car to Inverclyde tomorrow. Uh, uh, yeah, just to, to remind everyone, uh, so it will be Colin, Tabo, Spencer, Joe, Sarah, and Georgia. Guys, are you ready for the second round? <laughs> then I will fuck about no longer. Guys, please help me welcome back to the stage your first slammer in the second round. Go absolutely wild for Colin Nelson! <laughs> This is a tribute to my one-year-old's favorite song. <laughs> Little Peter Rabbit has a fly upon his nose. Watch it very closely now to see just where it goes. It crawls up Peter's nostril despite his panicked throes. And now it's laying eggs in his brain. <laughs> Peter Rabbit feels unwell Peter's lost his sense of smell Peter's brain starts to swell And his head hurts all the time There's four more verses, strap in <laughs> Little Peter Rabbit's host to a nasty parasite a microscopic beastie that his body cannot fight. It munches through his cortex, through a day and a night, and it's spreading through his brain. Peter cries himself to sleep. Peter has good cause to weep. For Peter's doom is on the creep. And he knows he can't avoid his fate. Little Peter Rabbit tries to carry on with life. Ignore the bleak horror of his parasitic strife. But it's carving through his skull meat like a hot butter knife. And he can't quite bear the pain. Peter Rabbit is in hell. Peter's mind is just a shell Peter can't even tell Where the rabbit ends and the parasite begins <laughs> Little Peter Rabbit's in a waking nightmare The parasite's in full control but Peter's still aware <laughs> Flushed with sudden lust for carnivorous fare now flesh is all he craves. <laughs> Peter Rabbit is a changing. Peter's mind is deranging. Peter's sense of self is fading. 
and he can't quite recall his own name. <laughs> Little Peter Rabbit isn't there anymore. The parasite has burrowed down into his cranial core. It's already forced him to devour his siblings for. It thrives on meat and pain. Peter Rabbit is a zombie. Peter Rabbit is a zombie. Peter Rabbit is a zombie. And he hungers for your brains. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone of the intro to that poem was, this is my one-year-old's favorite song. <laughs> Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we will make sure Colin gets the help he so desperately needs. Uh, <laughs> that three grand's gonna go to some shrink, that's for sure. Uh, guys, we move on to our next slammer in the second round. Please give all the love, make all the noise for Tabo McCollum. Oh, McCollum. <laughs> It's not as easy. It's not as easy to walk away from the mirror when all you do is study the signs of your former self. A fading light, searching for proofs of a pain locked inside. Bones, so brittle. Skin, so thin. Each day slips into an uncontrollable, uncontrollable dream. Another food wrestle ensues from within. Dear diary, today I've eaten half a cracker, a bowl of mixed veggies, two soup cubes. I no longer depend on food like I used to. The whispers in my ear keep telling me to lose more kilo jewels. Dear diary, my stomach rejects the food I consume. The little strength I have erupts through the mouth in a form of thick fluid. But the whispers in my ear keep telling me to lose more kilo jewels. Dear diary, I am a result of a dreadful childhood. These eating disorders emerge from an abusive household. Wearing baggy clothes to cover the weight loss brings me face to face with the soul I have lost. But the whispers in my ear keep telling me to lose more. Keep telling me to lose more. Kilo jewels. Dear diary. Today, Today I had another medical emergency, however. This time around, I did not slash my arm like I did when I was young, it is different. I scuffled, kicked the blankets, opened the eyelids, found drips beneath the armpits in oblivion, I asked, where am I? What am I doing here? Am I sick? The doctor replied. <coughs> yes. According to this report, you may be an erect sick. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, please keep that applause building, keep that energy in the room as we welcome back to the stage, Spencer Mason! Here I lay my body a pestle, a layer of sand between skin and sinew through the skylight above watching puffins ruffle themselves into hand grenades, their feathers falling like blitzkrieg shrapnel. 
and a beak falls between the pages of my Rate Tate novel and this timid worm that squirms out indicates to me that chapter one is never the starting point of the story. So I am fidgeting in chapter three and my body is a prophecy. All I have to do is live in it. As I gaze upward, are the empty train station's exposed ribcage curving its vertebra against the rain. But by chapter five, right, my body has been made revolution. Some revulsion to these hyena eyes that drip thick globs of cobric envy. The scorpion tail tips of their teary drool drowning another young, not white. Boy in the channel and dissecting the diction of women until we are as articulate as come dine with me on mute. Crocheting this wool of an amicable enough colour around our iris so that we might at least be cosy in the lies that arise from the tides of our demise. Oh, but there is still itch, our hands threading, begging for one last bit of scratch in midwinter starts and choices between heating or eating and whether the boiler should be put on for the dishes or your body. As our semi-elected father of a diatribe religion reminds us how lucky Lucky we are to be kissed by democracy once every half fucking decade. And his decadent wig loosens and it falls to the floor so that we might almost see the cogs of his connivance. But the machine moves quick and his mouth is blinding in his boast of Brexit means Brexit when it's more of a force-fed rectal fisting, fishering families and friends because ours is a country but the companies and long love the fuckery. Empathy is a broadcasted facade of swarming cicadas and ingredients appreciating love as a fakery so erroneous and pure. Chapter 8. My body is a tapestry, stitched with sentiments that could carve countries from different cuts of meat and serve them on one plate, the same crimson for gravy. And you remember when your mother told you, as you danced through the grime of student halls for the first time, that the more colours there were on a plate than the healthier the meal was. But Britain loves its batter and tatty and beige, and it would strip the rainbow of her silk if it could but make the horizon routine. We welcome back to the stage now. Please go absolutely wild for the wonderful Joe Hunter! Big man wakes. Big man stretches and shakes. Big man breaks open an 8 a.m. can because, hey, big man can. Big man plays golf with other big men. Big man does not like calling them his friends. Big man uses his days to pretend that he or anyone likes golf. <laughs> big man goes to the pub with other weary souls. Big man gets too drunk, he thinks he's too old. Big man wants to smoke but he's too drunk to roll so he asks the bouncer. <laughs> big man can't do it himself. This is the first and last time that big man asks for help. Big man sent home in a state without his rollie. Big man makes it home however slowly. Big man mutters no one really knows me. Big man fears that he will never not feel lonely. Big man wanks over pictures of his ex-wife. Big man gets cum in the corner she used to clean and now wonders why his room doesn't smell nice. Big man wakes. He wishes he didn't. Big man sends dick pics to random women. Big man pisses in the kitchen sink. Big man sighs as he opens another drink. Big man's back pub bound this time alone. Big man's calling his mates. No one's picking up the phone. Big man keeps drinking and doesn't know why that the drinking stops him thinking that one day he's gonna die. Big man knows he should but doesn't know how to leave because no one taught big man how to just breathe. No one taught big man how to properly grieve. In fits of frustration across the bar, big man sees me. 
And Big Man does not like what he sees. Big Man sees a man in a dress and high heels. Big Man thinks that this shit cannot be real. Big Man's fucking had it. Big Man calls me a faggot. Big Man calls me a tranny. Big Man grabs me and I can still feel Big Man's hands on me. Big Man doesn't understand me. Big Man resents that a bender this femme could be more manly. Big Man gets chucked out of the place. Big Man spits in the bouncer's face. Big Man makes comments about the bouncer's race. Big man isn't followed, but he runs like he's chased. Big man's worried that he will always be running. Big man feels that he will amount to nothing. Big man feels blisters forming on his feet. Big man feels thoughts flying faster than the street. Big man wishes that he called his friends as such. Big man wishes that he showed his kids more love. Big man wishes he showed more empathy. Big man wishes he didn't say shit to me. Big man wishes he confronted his dad. Big man wishes he told someone he was sad. Big man laments the things that life never had because big man thinks he's dying and big man is glad and then big man is home. Big man is safe. Big man has won this imaginary race, but big man does not feel like a winner. Big man batters and shatters his bathroom mirror and big man cries and cries and cries. And then big man sleeps and this big night ends and big man vows he will never get like that again. Big man wakes. Big man stretches and shakes. Big man breaks. Keep that applause going. Keep it building. Keep the energy going as we welcome back Sarah Gray. On an episode of Mythbusters, the team conducts an experiment entitled Do Bigger Breasts Mean Bigger Tips in the Service Industry? <laughs> As a veteran of six years in the service industry and the owner of some stellar knockers, I have this topic so pinned down to a science that on a trip to Canada, a coffee and hooters came with an application form. <laughs> my service with a smile gets me chat, banter, confession sometimes, but my service with the top button and my shirt undone gets me money in the service industry. It is never about what you want. The customer is always right. The customer only wants you to serve. So I learned to smile with burning hands and burning eyes, their gaze five inches south, but it's fine because I guess waitressing pays well, right? So, yes, unnecessary Mythbuster experiment. Well done. I knight the masters of the fucking obvious. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of myth busting, one, yes, they're real. Two, no, I don't feel anything in them. Three, I don't know why, but sometimes when I accidentally hit my nipple off something, it takes three seconds for the pain to catch up. Like, ah! <laughs> Four, nothing fits me ever. Five, no, I've never knocked myself out with my own breasts. <laughs> sometimes I wish I had, though, because I'm certain a punch in the face is less painful than these questions. The last man who saw me naked got angry with me because I was uncomfortable. To be fair, he was trying to kiss my tit while we were watching an episode of Preacher. Who does that? <laughs> Baby, he said, you've had these things your whole life. Don't be greedy. Let me have my fun. The last man who put me up against the wall without my permission didn't even fucking look at my face, his gaze five inches south and skipped out on the bill. My best friend wants to be a father. We talk about children often and he judged me when I said I wasn't sure if I wanted them. I'd be missing out on the opportunity to feed the children I'm scared to have in the service industry. It is never about what you want. My mother says she only has small breasts because she breastfed and I feel I need to apologize for taking away her worth. When they told my grandmother the bad news, she submitted to the scalpel. When they told her sister May, she never said anything at all. May was gone by the time they told her daughter Kim, the women in my family have been dissected enough. Are we just pieces of flesh, fresh and ready for consumption? No, because I spent years of my life building this body into a home that I am happy to live in. This body is the armor for my organs. Stop asking me if I'm afraid to lose that thing that makes me a woman. Honey, I learned to smile while everything was on fire. I have been dissected enough. I'll submit to the scalpel like my grandmother before me and sure, go ahead, you take out that thing you think makes me a woman. Just you leave in that thing that makes me a warrior. This house cannot be torn down from the outside. This body is more than just flesh. I am not packaged or marketed or chilled. So no more of my burning eyes or their bloody hands because I don't work in the service industry anymore. Yeah! We
We have come to the final poet in the second round. Please go absolutely nuts for Georgia Bartlett McNeil! Fact. Human handwriting will change its presentation depending upon the mood of the writer. When you are in a bad mood, the letters are significantly shorter in height and narrower in width than when you're not. You don't even need to be happy, just not sad. Fact, on the days where I feel like I take up too much space, which at the moment are more days than I would care to admit, I cram myself into an A5 sheet of paper. This says both nothing and everything about me. I guess you'll have to read between the lines to figure out which it is. Fact, some days I feel like I have more in common with a coiled spring than with other people. I am full of potential. This is to say I am volatile. Fact, the word volatile comes from the Latin volatilis, which means to fly. Fact, my skeleton is a glorified birdcage. My skull is a nest for magpies, my heart for hummingbirds, my throat for starlings. There is a reason why I am constantly vibrating. Fact. Did you know at rest that the human body generates enough electricity to power a 100 watt light bulb? Sometimes I feel like my light blew out years ago and there is not another bulb in existence that will fit into the socket. Fact, I always feel like I take up too much space. Fact, I'm sorry. Fact, I am too well versed in the art of the apology. Fact. The further I get into this poem, the shorter and narrower the letters are becoming. Fact, did you know that if you ever get stabbed, you should not remove the weapon? That its presence is the very thing that prevents the hemorrhaging? But how the hell can you ever hope to heal unless you acknowledge that the damage has happened? Fact, I have no interest in being a human pincushion. I am not 15 years old anymore, but I am so worried that these daggers have rusted into me. I have no idea where I end and they begin. Fact, it is so nice to feel like you are a home for something. But it's even worse when you are lucid enough to acknowledge what that thing is doing to you. Fact, there is a reason why the accomplice gets punished alongside the offender. Fact, this does not mean to say that this is my fault. Fact, this is not my fault. I am not the enemy. But I don't have enough pans to take out all the knives, put pressure on the wounds, and wipe away the tears all on my own. Fact, I don't always know how to ask for help. Fact, I don't always want to. Fact, I don't know if this poem is finished or not. But the letters, the letters have grown too small for me to read. Can we just get a huge round of applause for all of our second round slammers? Wow! Oh, sorry, judges. Bex is so angry, they're leaving. Uh, <laughs> overwhelmed. Uh, Guys, that was fucking stellar. Uh, not to sound like a broken record, but again, like you can see the difficulty for the judges, right? Like any six, uh, any of those six could easily go through to the final. Any three of them could could go on to win. It is that is crazy. Uh, I am very glad I'm not a judge, and kind of also glad I'm not competing. Uh, fucking hell. Uh, Guys, if, like I said, if you are interested in following along, this is the last regional heat, but we do have one more slam, uh, and that is going to be at the Edinburgh International Book Festival on the 26th of August. Yeah, uh, it's it's very exciting because, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's for spoken word especially, like, uh, I don't know about your August, but our August is mostly basement orientated. Uh, so it's very nice to be, you know, out in the light of the book fest. Uh, it means a huge amount to us to have that kind of stage, that kind of platform for spoken word. Uh, so it's a 
one thing we're very proud of it's a pay what you feel event so if you want to come along if you want to support what i am sure will be an absolutely fantastic pair of representatives for the central belt then please do get your tickets they are available now you can jump onto the eibf website uh, and grab stuff i, I know there's uh, some awesome spoken word stuff going on michael mullen and leila josephine are doing a show at the eibf which we're very excited for uh, harry baker is going to be up doing um uh, a spoken word workshop like for slam and stuff along with uh, Courtney Stodder and uh, Nassim Rebecca Assel who are two absolutely tremendous poets that we've had on the, the stage in the last couple of years so please do find those little nuggets of spoken word at the book fest and at the rest of the fringe Speaking of Fringe, uh, if you're interested in seeing more of Loud Poets, while this, uh, we won't be back to our regular show until September, but we do have three Fringe shows right here at the Scottish Storytelling Centre. We are going to be on the first three Fridays of the Fringe uh, with our Loud Poets Best of Fringe, where we'll have four amazing guests, an hour and a half show. We will cram in as many poems as possible to that hour and a half. It'll be wonderful. Uh, for those that have been coming along, Poetry Jukebox will be happening. It'll be very exciting. Uh, so please do... Uh, consider checking them out and the rest of the program here at the Storytelling Center. We are always so, so excited to be part of what the Storytelling Center does. We have been putting on Fringe shows here since 2014 and the lineup every year is spectacular. Daniel Abercrombie, who is the uh, sort of program programmer here, he, he does fantastic work. And I know this year, uh, Stuart Kenny and, and his uh, ensemble of, of creatives uh, are here with Bear With Me, their amazing sort of spoken word music illustration show about polar bears <laughs> they're amazing it's just puns and wholesomeness it's wonderful um I know there's a bunch of uh, amazing people that are going to be uh, putting work on at the Storytown Centre. So please do come along, come and support some shows. Venues like this, independent venues at the Fringe, get a raw deal. We are here year round. The Storytown Centre here is here year round, putting on fantastic work, platforming incredible artists, and they deserve your support even in August when, you know, the shiny folks show up with their big tents. Uh, just remember who is here when it's a cold fucking February, eh? So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing uh, you all live here you get it the Glaswegians they're confused but we're bitter uh, so <laughs> just just get on board uh, the note is for me not for you alright building atmosphere yeah, yeah. Uh, I got things to say first this goes in the pocket Georgia uh, and the more you chirp about it the longer it'll stay in the pocket that's uh so we were all here at Low Point. No, I will do the thing. I'll do the thing. Because uh, the poets will flip the fuck out. Uh, that is... Um, give me a second. I don't want to do the Oscars thing. It's my biggest fear is that I'm going to shout a name and then I'm going to hear Bex go, Nope. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, going through to the, the third round. In the order they will be reading in, we will do one big cheer... <laughs> at the end Georgia Bartlett McNeil <laughs> Sarah Grant and Joe Hunter Again, if it was the other three, the whoop would be just as loud, the, the, the accolade would be just as deserved. Like, I, I can only imagine that there were fractions of points. Uh, yeah, the judges are, <laughs> the daggers going on. Uh, so yeah, like, please do not be disheartened. If you went out first round, if you went out second round, it was spectacular. You are spectacular. A different night, different judges, a different running order, whatever would absolutely change the outcome of that. Can we just get one big round of applause for all of our slammers? So, as I said, uh, the final round is going to come with a little music. So can we please have back our beautiful music man, Mr. Jack Higgs! <laughs> Jack has no point giving power. Uh. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so as I said before, uh, when you come up to the mic, give Jack three words. You can say them into the mic because they've done that at other slams. They've went over to Jack and like, let the people know too. Um, but yeah, so give them the, your three words and then do your thing. Guys, are you ready for the final round? <laughs> Then please help me welcome back to the stage the fantastic Joe Hunter! Oh, did I fuck that up? Wait, did I do that in the wrong way? It's really fucking hot up here, guys. Hold on, yeah, I'm sure. We're gonna pretend that never happened. We're gonna go from the, the bell, yeah? Are you ready for the final round? Then please help me welcome back to the stage the equally fantastic Georgia Barlamignia! Jack, your three words are it's man's world. I will look to you. <laughs> Simmer down, I've not started yet. Fuck. This is a man's world. This is a man's world. But it wouldn't be nothing, nothing. I bumble along through the world of online dating, hoping somewhere I'll meet my perfect match. At every failed conversation, I find myself saying, OK, Cupid, it doesn't matter. I know I'm a catch, and there's plenty of fish in the sea anyway. Keep gathering kindling, searching for tinder, bashing the rock and the hard place together, trying to create a spark that will catch, build a bonfire of love that will be over in a flash or look more meaningful to me than to the person on the other side of the app. I fucking hate this! But they say nothing in this world can take the place of persistence, so nevertheless I persist, continue to plaster my prettiest pictures on the digital pinboards and hope I'm someone's pick, hope that the next person I speak to isn't a prick or isn't feeding me just the right words to try to get me to sit on his dick. At this point, I'm simply unhinged. I thought I was an elite single. My own flat, my own car, a good education, a good job. Plus, I have all my own teeth. And I'd like to think I have a fairly decent personality. And where that fails, I have a kitten. And I have so many hobbies. I play sports, do poetry, play video games, watch movies, play four instruments, do photography. But somehow that's still not good enough for someone to want to make a life with me. I have well-meaning friends that say, just go and get laid, but that's not my style, that isn't really me. I can't throw myself at the first person I see, lie down, spread my legs and scream for them to just take me. I need a connection with some e-harmony. And I can accept I'll not be everyone's cup of tea. I'm too loud, too chatty, too soft, too curvy. Excessive is perhaps the best word you could use to describe me. I'm an independent, badass, boss bitch with a hint of needy. I'm kind and I'm smart and I'm honest and I'm strong. But if that's not your thing, then don't string me along. Don't get my hopes up. Then ghost me when I've given you what you wanted as if you had a right to it. Or not accept a no as a valid answer because come on, baby. We're young, baby. We've got nothing better to do, baby. I said no! I said no. I said my body is too sacred. I am trying so hard to unlearn my intrinsic hatred of it. It is too precious a thing for me to give to you, only for you to return it if it doesn't fit the way you thought it would, the way you thought it should. So here's a little tidbit. You can have this one on me. I do not exist to bridge the gap between what you want and who you need. Man may have made everything, but man sure as fuck didn't make me. This is a man's world. But it wouldn't mean nothing, nothing, not one little thing without a woman or a girl. Times the male host doesn't want to come back to the mic. <laughs> Guys.
Guys, her penultimate poet in the second round, please build up that energy, get that applause rippling through, build up that noise, and welcome back to the stage, Sarah Gray! Jack, this one's new and it only has two words. It's faith and wonder. It's the 15th of April, 2019, and news that Notre Dame in Paris, my favorite place in the world, has burned down. 15 and on a school trip, sick, feverish, and delirious. I am so ill. My year group head, Mr. Marshall, carries me into cathedral, cool sanctuary, and clarity as the light of God, or architecture, washes through an awakening. It makes you want to sing, I said, out my face, crying. And Marshall, he's crying too. Years later in Barcelona, I am unprepared for the Sagrada Familia. The stone broken story is a sight and I feel dizzy trying to take in this mess of worship someone tried to carve from stone. Worship in my experience has always been messy. Tourists sit and check their emails while waiting for mass to start holidaying through Catholicism. I don't sit even though I want to. I don't take photos, even though I want to. Wonder doesn't look good on a postcard. I am completely overwhelmed by the power of yet another big church. It makes you want to sing, or be 15 again, or pray a little. My grandmother calls the church the Chunky. It's short for Chunky Pineapple. Chapel, in rhyming slang. She is my idol. My grandmother is a big church. When she talks, I think about the early days of the Bible and I have congregation in my ears and I don't believe in God anymore. I did for a while, but it was one of the many things I lost to teenage years and it's all just a fever dream now. And the Arts Council application is a big church. Prayer is one of the many hoops we have to jump through just to serve our purpose. And my bras are a big church. Accidental cult leaders who never asked to be followed, but woke up one day with a flock of acolytes looking for greater meaning and I get it but at the end of the day sorry it's just a body and what were you looking for anyway in Barcelona there's a group of girls outside flocked around a selfie stick and duck pouting for the angels a seraphim chorus with gospel smiles and all our trauma is a big church it's there in the knowing that the invaders raiders and pillagers will leave nothing standing but the stone is left after we and everything else has burned down and we are the the only thing I have faith in anymore. Stone benches line the walls of the Sagrada Familia and the warm Barcelona October leaves its heat at the door and I am cool for the first time in days. I am unprepared for this and every other big church. There is a tiny space at the back of chapel reserved for prayer. I don't go in even though I want to. I don't believe. I leave knowing that I have gotten everything I need from this place. It's you. It's heaven. It's here. Thanks. We have come to the final poet of the third round, so please give all that love Hold that energy, leave nothing out. Please go absolutely wild for the wonderful Joe Hunter! Jack Flinney, your words are intense building riffage. Let's dance. Body horror, horror body. I feel something on me, snarling, crawling, peeling away putrid, appalling layers of flesh. Divots of mesh in my skin, soft to the touch. Nikki rush as I feel my chest contort and compress. In this moment, I am in the shape of a dress. The moon is dressed as Saturn tonight. Clouds cross the middle to impersonate rings. It's funny how covering one part can change 
everything body horror horror body nothing can be fixed till it's all broken so hate me till cracks form berate me till this shell is torn hell hath no fury like a redacted scorned what am i why am I? Target me with your diatribe. Skin split, start to emit bad vibes. And I apologize. Because in this moment, I am in the shape of spite. Body horror, horror body. Miffed at the mist that makes most things foggy. I crave to feel your vulgar vitriol. Because even if it is darkness, it is still something added to fill the hole. Something that makes me feel more whole. Even if I flail scared out of control, at least I am seen, right? A brutal, too bright spotlight illuminating the cold black night. In this moment, I am in the shape of restless thought, desperate. In this moment, I am in the shape of a landmine, press it. In this moment, I am every shape and no shape at all. Because my body is not my own. When bodies are constantly prodded at and thrown around the wrestling ring of your toxic debate. When labels and pronouns you thrust upon me add more weight, autonomy is blown into a million tiny parts, into a million tiny wishes that I could restart as something new, something that I know to be true, something completely and utterly separate from the horror body that is you. Because I am my own body. I am not your fucking boy. And I am not your girl. I am my own amalgamation of everything that I value in this world. I am my own product. I am my own being. I am my own clumsy version of omniscient all seeing. I see the defamation that you throw on our name. I see your proclamations, your attempts to shroud us in shame. But your desperate attempts to darken sparks only fan flame. I am my own broken. I am my own beaten. I am my own chewed up, spat out, not eaten. I am my own living. I am my own surviving. I am my own accession, my own thriving. I am my own. I am my own. I am my own. And you cannot take that from me. Under skin, past bone, I am my own body horror. Horror body. I feel something on me. There is something more in me. Can we just get a huge round of applause for all of our slammers? That is a hell of a final round. <laughs> hey, guys, what an amazing slam. Again, like, I, I would say it's on blue in the face. Like, that could have been won by anyone from the first round. And by the time you get to that final round, it could go anyway. Uh, once the scores have been tallied, I will read up the, 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 the runner-up and the winner. Uh, the winner gets uh, 200 quid for winning this evening, uh, and the winner and the runner-up both qualify for the Grand Slam final on the 26th. Please do come and support whoever wins. Uh, it has been a hell of a night, and they will be a hell of a force at the Grand Slam final. The The other 10 poets are also incredible. Like Genuinely, I am so excited for the Grand Slam final. It is going to be an amazing snapshot of the Scottish scene as it stands right now. Uh, it's going to be incredible. So thank you for being part of it, for rounding off our regional heats and hopefully we will see you at the final. Hey, Jack, yeah. whiskey nature love. I'll just do a poem. I'm out of plugs. That, <laughs> that round fucking wrecked me. Uh, cool. Stand in the clearing. Stand so still. The only sound you hear is your own breathing. Or the deafening drum of bumblebee wings beating. Each drop of dew falls so slow, it could be a petal's pearl earring. Have you ever stood so still that you see time retreating, leaving lines of light like waves, not quite breaking, taking too long to touch, suspended just above our reaching? We call that feeling 
lap. The only time winning is in crossing the finish line first. The goal is the slow crawl, the patient pace of not moving at all. Not a rolling stone, but a blanket of moss tossed upon the forest floor. Soft and warm. It can be a hard lesson to learn. When reality screams at us, move faster. To play Mother Nature's master. That to move too slow is to court disaster, but move too quick. You might just pass her. Never meet the feeling of grass beneath your feet. Never speak to the trees about how it feels to grow so old or get to know the face of freshly fallen snow. There is so much a single moment can show. If you move slow enough to allow it, in patience there is power and knowing when to hold to the seed or when to flower. Can we get a huge round of applause for Jack Hanks? one's on Jack. It's normally me that fucks about it. Uh, guys, it's been an incredible slam. Uh, as I said, I'm just going to read out the uh, runner-up and the winner, all right? Can we get a little drum roll, please? Our runner-up, who will be heading to represent the central belt at the 2023 Live Poets Grand Slam Final, please make some noise for Joe Hunter! <laughs> Start that drum roll again. <laughs> Joining Joe at the Grand Slam final as the Central Belt Loud Poets 2023 Slam Champion. Please go absolutely fucking nuts for Georgia Barlamini! Genuinely, let me take a minute. Um, this lineup was so stacked. When I, to get drawn out of the hat was one thing and then I saw the folk on this fucking bill and I was like, oh shit. Oh fuck. Um, I, I have no words, which is uh, for folk that know me, that's, that's not. I hear you laughing, Naomi. I can't see you, but I can hear you laughing. Um, I'll do a, I don't want to call it a victory poem because as much as sounded like a dick, we're all winners tonight. <laughs> the winners are poetry. Um, but I will attempt to do, because this poem's not written down, but it's the poem that kind of started it all. The people that call me the juggernaut, they know this poem. There are people that know I'm called the juggernaut but don't know why. So I haven't done this poem in a long time. I don't think I've done it since the last time I competed in a slam. So I think this will be a fitting farewell to this poem because it is very old. This is the juggernaut. In my last graded assignment, I got a B. Now ask the 14 year old me what a B means and it wouldn't be something she was happy with. See, let me tell you, if you don't know already that university is a much deeper kettle of fish than high school ever made it out to be, the rules of the game are no longer the same. In fact, it's not even really the same game. And we, she and I, have seen so much change in uh, 14 years. Rules, the names of city streets, the way the cobblestones are paved, and the sound and speed of the falling rain. And one thing I now see, despite the fog that almost always surrounds me, only varying with different degrees of density, is that a B is distinctly above average, no matter what way you look at it. 
I am above average. I'm above average in these, these big, beautiful size 18s. It's not just anyone that can look this good whilst carrying the bountiful sands of my time within this barrel chest and this abdomen. These not very denim encased man crushers I call my thighs can do way more damage than those of a smaller size. I am above average in the diameter of my upper arms. My biceps might make your toes curl, but I was senior shot put champion in another world. And yeah, I know it ain't ladylike, but do you even lift, bro? No, because it's not ladylike. But I could if I wanted to. I mean, have you fucking looked at me? I can carry the weight of the world using only my back. I've been doing it for 15 years, so cut me some slack. I'm above average in these, these bigger than Bs, better than double D, size Gs. Who says these aren't ladylike motherfuckers? Yeah, I've got a killer rack, but if I'm on the attack, know that I can run 100 meters in 17 seconds flat. My friends call me the juggernaut. I have broken through brick walls and glass ceilings and even the bars that my own feelings keep me caged behind. I am above average because I am. I choose to exist. Don't put stock in things that are graded. No one ever got through this life unaided anyway. So when I tell you that the best thing that you can do for you is to just be, please listen to me. Thank you so much. Guys, what an absolutely phenomenal slam. Uh, I, I, we, have, we have overrun slightly, so I'm going to ask, I'm asking you all, when, when you head out, please, like, I know you'll all want to hug a poet. I'm sure you've all got a poet you want to desperately hug, but please do so upstairs. For now, can we just get one big round of applause for our wonderful judges? For our sensational, sacrificial poet, Matt Abbott. For the spectacular Mr. Jack Higgs. For our wonderful tech in the booth, give it up for Roddy. And one absolutely giant roar for all of your slammers. This has been the Loud Poets Central Heat. I hope we see you at the book fest. Hi, I've been Kevin McLean. You have been fucking brilliant. We will see you again. Good night. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you wanna go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help guys and hopefully we'll see you again soon.